after two years of marriage, a husband came home and from work and his wife greeted him at the door with a hug and a kiss and said, honey, I've got some news for you. In just a little while, we're going to have an addition to our family. He said, are you serious? I mean, you made me the happiest man in the world. And she said, I am so glad to hear how excited you are that mom is coming to live with us. Not what he was expecting. This is a beautiful day in the life of the church at Westside. If you have not had a chance to pick up a bulletin. There are still some out there. You don't have one. There are also some sermon notes for today, which are out there on the front desks. If you don't want to get up and make a scene, but you want one, if you take a look on your bulletin in the top right corner, there's a scan code there, a QR code, where you can get the notes for the sermon today. There's also a list of classes that are going on after services. We'd love for you to stay and be a part of that. There's a class going on here in the auditorium on uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. And there's also um, a class on fundamentals of the faith being taught by Mike Chance in the, in the chapel. There's a class called Dive Deeper that goes deeper into the lessons that are presented on Sunday morning uh, going on upstairs. And we'd love for you to be any part of any one of those. There's a singles class uh, being in which they're discussing the wisdom literature. And there are classes for every age uh, under heaven. And we are so glad that you're here with us. And we'd love for you to be a part of it. I also want you to notice that after the sermon, after the invitation song, listed in the bulletin, it says that we're going to have a baby and parent blessing. You know, church is a family. And as a family, we do important things together. If there's a serious ailment in the family, we gather together to pray about that as a family. If there's an exciting event, we gather together to enjoy that exciting event as a family. That's what families do. And this morning, we're going to recognize all the children that God has seen fit to bless us with as a family over the past two years and celebrate as a congregation the parents who have decided to raise those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that is a good thing. It's a good thing for at least three reasons. First, childbirth, welcoming children into the world, ought to be a church welcoming event. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm willing to bet the majority would raise their hands on these. If you were married in a church, if somebody you love had their funeral in a church, or if you or somebody you know was baptized during a church service. It's interesting that when we are united as one flesh with our spouse, or united as one flesh with the Lord, or when the Spirit departs the flesh to be in the presence of the Lord, we tend to think these are holy events, and we celebrate them as a church family. The only other event I can think of, of the same level of significance, is bringing our children into the world. It makes sense for us to think about that as something for the church to celebrate together. Second, some people refer to what we're going to do today as a blessing, and there's Bible for that. That's a great little line. Make a t-shirt. There's Bible for that. Blessings in the Old Testament. Whenever you ha wanted to talk about inheritance or birthright or just a sense of we love you and want you in the family, they'd bring you to the patriarch and he'd give you a blessing. It carries over. In the New Testament, whenever you're hurting or struggling, you call for the elders of the church to pray over you. The idea of patriarch or the one in charge saying a prayer and offering on your behalf a lesson or message to God so that he may bring blessing into your life. Very biblical idea. Some people also refer to it as a dedication opportunity, dedicating your children to the Lord. And there's Bible for that. Maybe you remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 1 where Hannah wanted a child so bad that she made a vow to the Lord. And in verse 11, she said that, Lord, if you will not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. The Lord gave her a son, and he named her, he named her, uh, she named him Samuel, quote, because I asked the Lord for him. And then Hannah told her husband, 
after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. And after Samuel was weaned, she brought him to Eli. And Hannah said, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. Now, there's some background that might have been in her mind. For example, in Exodus chapter 13, there was a law that said every firstborn male, whether it's a a baby born or it's an animal, is to be holy and consecrated or set apart for the Lord. Maybe she was thinking about this law given in Leviticus over and over again, that when you make an offering to God, You're supposed to present it before the Lord. I don't know. But what Hannah did was not a law of Moses. What Hannah did was an offering of the heart in keeping with the kind of thing she saw in the law of Moses. That God wants things that are important to us to be given over to him as a sign that he comes first. And that whatever we have belongs to him. In fact, when you get to the New Testament in Luke chapter 2, you'll see that this idea of dedicating the child to the Lord had become pretty standard. In Luke 2, 22, the text says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to, quote, present him before the Lord. That's the Leviticus language. And then he quotes from Exodus 13, as it's written in the law, every firstborn is to be consecrated to the Lord. There's no doubt that Mary and Joseph were keeping the law of Moses. But Luke uses his words very carefully to tell you what's happening here is far more than just keeping a law. He paints the language to remind you not just of Exodus or Leviticus, but of 1 Samuel chapter 1 of the dedication that had nothing to do with the law of Moses. Because the, lay, the way Jesus is described in Luke 2 is the language of Samuel. If you don't see it in the dedication, then maybe you see it in the boy in the temple, which reminds you of Samuel in the temple. And if you don't see it there, maybe you'll see it in the last verse of Luke 2 that was already read for our hearing this morning, which is almost an exact quote from 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 26. Here's the quote from 1 Samuel 2, 26. And the boy Samuel grew in stature and in favor with God and man. What's happening is that the cry of the heart of Hannah is being seen as the example even carried over by Mary. And children being raised in the presence of the Lord has come to be the standard, as our standard bearer shows us. And then third, the reason why what we're doing today is a good thing is because it's a recognition that my child is not mine. He or she belongs to the Lord. You and I are stewards, not owners of our children. And parenting won't simply be my responsibility. We're going to join together as a family to raise this child in the way of Christ. There's an old African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. And I've always loved the way that the comedian Sinbad brought this home. He said, when I was growing up, if I ran away from my mother, in my neighborhood, there were 12 other mothers waiting to trip me. You know how this works. That is, I'm not just going to show Grace how to be raised in the light of Christ when she's in my home. She's going to learn how to do that when she's playing in your home. And it's not just going to happen when I'm having devotionals with her at night. It's going to happen in her Bible classes. It's going to happen when she's gathered with other girls her age in gatherings in your home. Our children belong to God even before we knew them, even before they belonged to us. He formed our children in the womb He had plans for them even before he made them. 
And it's fitting that we take time as a family, as a village, to ask parents to confess that their children belong to God and that we as a family declare that we will help raise this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 20 years ago, a poll was taken asking people to list things that they remember their parents saying to them. And the top six memorable lines of parents were these. Number six, someday your face will freeze like that. Number five, patience is a virtue. Number four, if your friends jumped off a cliff, would you jump off too? Number three, don't make me come over there. Number two, I'll give you something to cry about. And number one, because I said so. Oh, the frustrations of being a parent. Trying to dress an active little child is like trying to thread a sewing machine needle while it's running. Cleaning your house while kids are in the house is like trying to shovel the driveway during a snowstorm. There are only two things that a child will share willingly. Their mother's age and communicable diseases. And kids brighten up a house. They never turn a light off. And any child can tell you that the sole purpose of having a middle name is to know when they're really in trouble. I know that sometimes having children is not easy. Many of you have gone through difficulties, fertility, and so forth. But for the most part, becoming a parent is usually much easier than being a parent. A cartoon showed a psychologist talking to his patient. Let's see, he said. You spend 50% of your energy on your job, 50% on your husband, and 50% on your children. I think I see the problem. A four-year-old and a six-year-old presented their mom with a house plan. And they used their own money and she was thrilled. And the older one of them said with a sad face, there, there was a bouquet in the window that we wanted to give you from the flower shop. It was real pretty, but it was too expensive. It, it spoke the language that you talk about all the time. It had a ribbon on it and it said, rest in peace. And we just thought it'd be perfect for you. But then again, our children also recognize far more than we think. And they know what parents do for them. A teacher asked a boy this question. Suppose your mother baked a pie and there were seven of you and your parents were there and five children. What part of the pie would you get? I'd get a sixth, said the boy. I'm afraid you don't know your fraction, said the teacher. There's seven of you. Uh, yeah, teacher, said the boy, but you don't know my mom. Mom would say she didn't want any pie. She'd give me two. A teacher gave her class of second graders a lesson on the magnet and what it does. And the next day in a written test, she included this question. My full name has six letters, and the first one is M. I pick up things. What am I? 50% of the students answered, Mother. Parenting is hard, but rewarding. It's easy for a parent to feel inadequate, to wonder where to look for help and guidance. Thank God we have guidance as we look to God as our parent. Yes, he's our father. Three times in the Old Testament, God is called father. But in those cases, it's father as in the sense of originator, giving birth to the children of Israel. It's been said that anyone can become a father, but it takes a special person to become a dad. Well, God is our originator, our father, but over 70 times in the New Testament, he's called father. And not just that. Jesus didn't call him our father. He called him my father. And not just that. On the lips of Jesus, but also on the lips of Paul in Galatians, we are to call him Abba, Father. It's that word that 
children would have learned when they were learning to form the word daddy. It means deep, sincere, close relationship. That's our father. But don't let that name fool you. God made males and females in the image and likeness of God. It's easy to assume that we as individuals image God on earth. That's true. But in Genesis 1, if you read the text carefully, the main point being made is that when the man and the woman join together to bring out from them another one of them, that is one of their flesh, they image God on earth. That is, by acting as a parent and by holding within themselves the attributes and traits that God has toward us is when we most image God on earth. God's our Father. But if male and female are made in the image of God and together they image God on earth, it makes sense that traits you normally see in your Father that are good and holy are traits that remind you of God, but traits you normally see in your mother that are good and holy are traits that reflect the glory and goodness of God. There are all kinds of families and all kinds of parents. Some of you are single parents, and God loves you. Some of you are parents who share custody with other parents, and God loves you. But I want you to know that our God holds within himself every trait needed to fully parent his children. And that means we learn by watching God how to be a mother and a father. Today, we pledge to image God on earth as we dedicate our children to the Lord. And this means, first of all, that we're going to raise our children with tenderness and compassion. Isaiah tells us that these are two traits that belong to God. As a mother comforts her child, Isaiah says, so I will comfort you. Jonah knew this side of the Lord. Do you remember his little speech to God in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2? I knew this was going to happen, says Jonah. I knew that you were a God who was gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from giving calamity. And he meant that as a criticism. You know what he's saying? God, you're not strong enough. You don't have the stomach to be God because you're a God of tenderness and compassion. But we know that tenderness is not weakness because our Lord shows it. It's strength. The God who brings both power to destroy and a willingness to save is our God. In Isaiah 42, God describes his servant, the one who's going to bear the imprint of his spirit. And he says, he will not shout or cry out in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Have you ever seen a branch that's been bent back and forth so much, it looks like it's just about to break? God says, when I see you like that, I won't let you break. You ever seen a candle almost just down to smoke that's about to go out? God says, when you're like that, I won't let you go out. Over and over again in the Bible, we're told of God's tender mercies. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, sings a song of praise in Luke chapter 1, and he speaks of the tender mercies of our God. And James, in the book that bears his name, speaks of the Lord who is full of compassion and mercy. God, our warrior king, is full of compassion 
The Israelites saw only the fire and the smoke and they stayed away, failing to move close enough to find the tender heart of God. So God sends that tender heart to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, I'm meek and lowly. Over and over again in the New Testament, Jesus is moved with compassion. He tells the story in Matthew 18 of the unmerciful servant, the one who is forgiven a huge debt he couldn't possibly pay back in his entire life, free of charge. But he's unable to do the same for his fellow Israelite. And the story of the king who forgives him the huge debt is meant to remind us of our God. It was the way of Jesus. And so it became the way of Jesus's people. Be kind to each other, writes Paul in Ephesians 4. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Paul was a man's man. But before he was a man's man, he was God's man. And he had no problem. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, writing these words. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother who cherishes her own children. We acted like God toward you, says Paul, in a way that you saw reflected in your mom. You saw the face of God. Second, we pledge to raise our children with what the King James calls nurturing. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Oh, I knew that one well. I knew that one because I used to quote that to my parents often. When you teach your children to memorize verses, just be aware they may be sarcastic. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The Bible says God has children. He raised them. He nurtured them. And he loves them. In Ezekiel 16, God sees on the side of the road a little baby that's been left there to die. And God picks up that baby, washes it off, feeds it, nurtures it, clothes it, holds it, and raises it. That's Israel. In Hosea 11, God cries out in language that surely reminds you of a loving parent. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I've called my son. And then God pauses to reflect on what's happened to his adult children. He remembers them playing on the tire swing. And now they're offering worship to Baal. He remembers gently rocking them and having them gently rock their baby dolls to sleep. And now they're, offer up, they're offering up sacrifices to false gods. And as it reflects, God says this, It was I who taught them how to walk. I took them by the arms and I taught them how to walk. But they didn't realize that it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. And to them, I was like one who lifts up a child to the cheek. And it was I who bent down to feed them. Which parent was it that had the spoonful of oatmeal and said, here comes the airplane? Who picked you up after you fell off your bike? For the first time. When they did so, they were reflecting the image of God. God is the perfect parent. Spiritually speaking, he does all those things for us. It was Jesus who said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. It's in the heart of God to protect and provide for his children. Jesus said, the birds of the air, 
They're fine. And the grass of the field, it's taken care of. How much more will God clothe you, O ye of little faith? We will provide for our children. We'll give them what they need. We'll be there to help them when they fall. We'll nurture them because God does that for us. And finally, we're going to instruct our children in the way of the Lord. The book of Proverbs is both clear and repetitive that parents are to teach their children well. Free will is a real thing. I don't believe that a parent is entirely responsible for what their 40-year-old son does. Free will means that a person can reject their teaching, reject their instruction. Give yourselves some room here. But if your goal is to do all that you can to help your child follow Jesus, then there are two most important things you can do. Number one, follow Jesus yourself in word and deed. And number two, teach your children how to do the same. Do we make church sound like a boring thing to do? David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Do we act as if knowing sports stats is more impressive and more meaningful than knowing the names of the sweet ladies who sacrifice their time to teach our children? Do we abdicate our responsibility, letting the TV raise our kids or the school system to raise our kids or the Bible class teacher to raise our kids? We're part of a village, to be sure, but we commit this day to do our part. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, starting with me. Paul said one of the most bold statements I have ever seen, one that would scare me to death sometimes to say, imagine doing this. He writes a letter to a church, and he says this, do what I do as I do what he does. Paul says to an entire church, just follow my lead as I follow Christ. I want God in my life, but my sins seem so big. The wall seems too high. Can't seem to do it. And I worry that my child's going to see my sins and not my strengths. You feel that? Jesus says, I get that. Follow me. Follow me as you watch what I do, because I want you to do that too. But even when you can't or you don't or you struggle, follow me as I go to the cross and I bear your sins for you. And when you can't point to your own ability to, to lead, you can point to the cross and remind your children that God has forgiven you. And that's why you are able to forgive them. We parents, we act first. We act first because here is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself to die for us. We only ask our children to do what they have heard and seen first in me. And the God of peace, the God of all glory, our ideal mother and father, will be proud that we raised his children, his children, that he has allowed us to steward for a short time, since our children, like ourselves, belong to the Lord. If we can help you in any way, won't you give your life to Christ or get prayers of your brothers and sisters in this village while we stand and sing an invitation song? There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Sweet expressions 
we'd ask all the families to come forward, please, and sit on the steps and the elders surround behind you. <laughs> While they're coming, I want to thank Mark Gregory for doing such a great job of putting this video together. Uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, I think we saw about 44,000 words right there. And Nathan, you can tell me how many sermons 44,000 words might be, but it was a lot. <clears throat> we at Westside are a community of believers and are richly blessed by these beautiful young families. We now want to call on God to grant us this grant this blessing on these beautiful children. I will read a blessing that we're going to ask God to grant us, and then Mike Chance will lead us in a closing prayer, also asking God for blessings. <clears throat> May you always have a family that will love you unconditionally, provide for you unselfishly, protect you fearlessly, train you endlessly, support you lovingly, and guide you tirelessly in the way of the Lord. May we as a church family surround you as a great cloud of witnesses to provide for you a Christ-like example, support you with prayer, train you in the knowledge of God's Word, and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. May you never fear God is with you. May the Lord strengthen you and give you peace. Let your eyes be fixed on God and let your heart seek His will. May you fully grasp how wide and deep is the love of God, and may you share that love with others. Mike. Shall we pray together? Father, we're, we're glad that we can come before you right now as your people, as a body of believers, as a body that loves you and loves each other. We're grateful for that opportunity, and we're grateful when we see the smiles of the youngest among us this morning. It brings joy to our hearts and hope to our lives. And Father, we just pray at this special moment in time that you would be with our families, because before there was a church, there was a family. Before there was government, there was a family. The family is where you invested the hope of humanity. And we just pray, Father, that you would help our families to be strong, help our husbands, our fathers to lead, help our wives to love and organize and manage. And we pray, Father, that you would help them to stand strong against the world because every single day, in so many ways, we're bombarded with falsehoods we're bombarded with pictures. We're bombarded with writings that are just not true about who we are and what the family should be. So we pray that you would bless these families among us. We pray, Father, that you would bless us as a church. Help us to live a life before these children that they may see truth in our lives, that they may see wisdom in the lives that we lead that they may see love and hope, that they may truly see you in those that are closest to them. We pray, Father, that you would be with each of these children. For we know that as they were being knit together in the womb, you knew them and you had a purpose for their lives. We pray, Father, for Grace Guy, and for Isla Robison, and for Ossie Martinez, and Huxley Goslin, and Deacon Reynolds, and Monroe Matt Richardson, and Claire Christian, Felicity Taylor, Thomas Halliburton, Beckett Crowder, Myla Boone, Sylvie Bell. We pray that each of these, as those who came before them, that you would bless them, that you would help them grow in body and in mind, but especially, Father, we pray that you would bless them that they may have an open heart, that their face may always be turned toward you. And we pray, Father, for the mates that these children will someday find. We pray that somewhere in the world that mate will be blessed, that they may truly find somebody to walk through life with that will help them get to heaven. 
We just pray, Father, that you give, give us courage and give us unsurpassing love for each other at this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.